introduction to bioethics course, and most of them had never taken an ethics course before or a bioethics course. A lot of them were in science and didn't really have any exposure to philosophical thinking or to bioethics in general. Um, and so they had a really um, interesting experience with the field, and so they were always asking me, well, what can I do um, to expand on what I've learned in class and things like that? Um, and they were also asking me about future career possibilities, and as a master's student, I didn't know everything, obviously, um, and so I was always trying to like, connect with those people and things like that. Um, but then I was also thinking, well, what other possibilities exist for undergraduate students to connect with either um, other graduate students that have experience, more experience maybe, um, or other professionals in the field, and I noticed that there wasn't really many opportunities. Um, and this was something that resonated with me because during my bachelor's, I was also a science student, and um, once I took the bioethics course, I kind of realized this is something I really enjoy, this is something I'm passionate about, um, what can I do with this? And I was really uncertain, I actually had to go to the career um, person at, the, at my school and talk to them about what options existed. And I, knew, I know a lot of students aren't interested in going to those places, so I thought, well, what options can there be to give um, undergraduate students and graduate students um, an opportunity to come together and discuss everything related to bioethics. And so hence, um, the U of T Bioethics was formed with help from uh, a planning committee and faculty at the Joint Center for Bioethics. And so now we're here. We have today over 200 members, which is really great to see that this is a growing field with a lot of interest. And uh, I'm just really happy to have another opportunity to open another venue to increase the discussion related to bioethics at the university. It's really exciting that the motivation that gave rise to the society is actually the reason we're here today, talking about careers in bioethics. Um, and so I would just like to acknowledge the panelists and uh, Ross, who's doing the introduction, Dr. Upshur, and um, just thank them for being here today and being willing to discuss this with all the student members. Um, so to start off the event, we will have Dr. Ross Upshur present on the future of bioethics. And this is obviously a discussion that's relevant for those that are thinking about future careers in bioethics or um, related to bioethics in some fashion, um, just to think about how their future careers can, uh, what their future careers should be focusing on. Dr. Ross Upshur is currently the Dalai Lama Chair in Clinical Public Health and the head of the Division of Clinical Public Health at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health. He's a scientific director of Bridgepoint Collaboratory for Research and Innovation and the associate director of London Fields Tynanbaum Research Institute Sinai Health System. At the University of Toronto, he is a professor in the Dalai Lama School of Public Health and the Department of Family and Community Medicine, affiliate member of the Institute of History and Philosophy of Science and Technology, and an adjunct senior scientist at the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Sciences. Dr. Upshur is a former director of the University of Toronto Bioethics, uh, Joint Center for Bioethics from 2006 to 2011. He's a member of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the College of Family Physicians of Canada. He was the chair of ethics committee of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada from 2012 to 2017. And he is currently the chair of ethics committee at the College of Family Physicians in Canada. In 2019, he was elected as a fellow of the Hastings Centre. He has consulted and serves on ethics boards for the Public Health Agency of Canada, the World Health Organization, and Doctors Without Borders. Obviously, he's an expert in many fields, um, so please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ross Upshaw. Good evening and thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here and just for the future uh, of bioethicists who want to engage me. If you offer me pizza, I will come um, and I'm, I'm easily persuaded. So uh, I'll be the warm up act for the people who really know what they're talking about coming up. We're very fortunate to have three very accomplished uh, bioethicists who worked in various different contexts and have done teaching and education. Uh, they're going to tell you what it's really about, and I'm just going to sort of make some stuff up uh, while I'm here. So the future of bioethics, what is the future of bioethics? Um, I'm not really sure I know, but I'm going to speculate a bit. 
Uh, I always want to start with my omnibus apology, so if you can't read it, it says, I just want to apologize in case I miss, or if you miss. So this is my apology for if I say something wrong, if I neglect to say something, if I forget your favorite theory or school of bioethics. So this just covers everything, and it's a very good rhetorical strategy, because then in question period, when somebody says, you didn't mention da-da-da, and I said, well, yes, but I apologized for it. So, <laughs> Uh, uh, so the future, what's next, uh, what's the past, what's the present, what's the future? And I think for if you're engaged in bioethics scholarship or if you want to be involved in bioethics practice, it's a really exciting time. Uh, I thought it was exciting when I first started back in the uh, 80s, uh, when I started in the medical school. I got into bioethics actually by default. I started as a philosopher. Um, and the only place where a philosopher, and then I went into medical school, and the only place where a philosopher could sort of mix their labor usefully was in bioethics. And even though I was more of a, more of a philosopher of science, epistemologist, they said, well, you, you studied philosophy, and I did a general degree, so I had to do ethics and history of philosophy. So it was interesting that something I didn't think was going to be particularly uh, uh, applicable in my lifetime uh, became very applicable. Uh, so the skills that you get from philosophy, from bioethics, that kind of analytic rigor is useful uh, and never underestimated. So I thought I'd just start with, I found this website by Chris Sula where he maps bioethics. So there's a lot of, uh, and, and of course the, this is a kind of taking the weight of the number of mentions and then the connectivity between the nodes. And I can send around the uh, link to this. But it just gives you a kind of snapshot of where we're at now in the field. So there's issues around medicine, professionalism, animal research ethics, health care, and then all sorts of things in the interstices. And then when you do a keyword, uh, you find the same sort of thing. It gets a bit crowded. I mean, you're not meant or intended to be able to read this, but it just gives you kind of a gestalt. There's a lot of concern about human ethics, and bioethics is meant to entail not just uh, human, but all of areas where ethical issues in the biosciences intersect. Uh, we often get more in, in, ingrained in uh, clinical issues, but I actually started in environmental ethics before I even got into clinical ethics, but that's another story for another day. Uh, so this just kind of gives you a sense that there's a lot going on. If you drill down and you go to that site, you can pull it apart and see the interrelationships between them. So one thing is, and I'm now going to speak more precisely, so more or less, most people who go into the bioethics are engaging with the health professions in some way. And I didn't put it on the slide, but there's actually increasing work to be done with organizations and organization leaders. And I'm hoping that uh, Marie Diane or Dave will speak to this. That working in a complex healthcare institution, you may think that your area of practice is going to be on cases, bioethics cases, but you often end up being brought into discussions around policies and organizational issues. And I've become increasingly interested in inter-organizational ethics. So there's a whole field about organizational ethics, which is how organizations represent themselves and think about the values that animate uh, them. But then when you start to look at how organizations in close proximity, and this is particularly the case for global health, how they interact with each other and how their values come together and clash in very interesting ways. So just to know that there's a great degree of heterogeneity. So if you're interested in medical ethics, well, there are 68 recognized specialties and subspecialties in Canada from the Royal College, and there's a family medicine which has various focused areas of competence. Nursing actually recognizes 66 different certificates. So there's different 66 different special areas of nursing. Uh, allied health, there's 25 allied health uh, regulated uh, professions in Ontario, and more than 50 recognized it on that authoritative source of Wikipedia, which is actually not a bad source for information for certain things because people will correct it if it's wrong. And so bioethics itself is a rather heterogeneous uh, group of people coming from very different backgrounds. And I think you'll hear because Maria, you come from Vermont, Dave, you're from philosophy, is that correct? And Diane, you came out of nursing and bioethics, right? So to say that you're a bioethicist is to say that you can be uh, a pluripotent stem cell. You can come from a variety of different places. Uh, you can actually 
get there and end there, even though you started out somewhere else. And uh, those of us who have been teaching in the uh, MHSC program have the great privilege of meeting people who have gone in, maybe differentiated themselves into one of these 68 specialties, applied their trade for a while, and then they start to get these niggling questions. And they say, uh, something's bothering me, and I'm not quite sure what it is. And then they go, oh, they find a label for it. This is an ethical issue. And then they dig a little further, and they find out there's actually people who think about research and actually discuss these issues, and then they come and uh, get some training. So people find their way to bioethics in a variety of different ways. And you'll find yourself working in a very wide variety of contexts. So I would just say, reflecting, you all have promise in front of you. The world is undifferentiated in terms of potential. Uh, I'm near the end of spent potential. And, and, but, but the interesting thing is, where I started out thinking what I was going to do, and where I am now, and all the things I've done in between, were completely unpredictable, which is why I'm sort of loath to say what the future of bioethics is, because I've had an almost completely non-linear career trajectory, but I've followed along uh, issues that have been of interest to me, uh, and those have driven me into some very interesting situations. So follow your passion, follow your instinct, at the same time as you are cultivating your skill set, your rigor, and your capacity to think, and think broadly. Also work on your people skills, because bioethics is a people-based, uh, at least applied bioethics. We'll talk a little bit about theory next. Um, but the simple point is that ethical issues are abundant in healthcare and abundant in our day-to-day uh, -day lives. They're often not recognized as such, and that's where the fun starts, because people will try all sorts of technical solutions and mislabeling the problem. And then when they've really got themselves tied into knots, they'll consult you guys, right? <laughs> and then when it's when the going gets rough. Right. So, of course, there's a big debate in bioethics, I'll be a bit philosophical and normative for a moment, about, you know, should we have, so last year I was invited to a conference, uh, the theme was theory and practice in modern bioethics, should we be, and if theory, what kind of theory? And so I had to give kind of one of the introductory talks and I started scratching my head and saying, well, there's a, a lot of different theories that are at play. Some of them are kind of, uh, you know, and this is just a list from a nice paper uh, by John Harris and has a taxonomy of theories relevant to bioethics. And there's a lot of them, right? Normative ethical theory, virtue ethics, high moral theory, which he's talking about there, deontology and uh, consequentialism, pluralistic theories, convergence theories, common morality theories, normative theories of limited scope, I like that in particular, right? And then meta-ethics. So you need to have your, you know, so your future depends on how much uh, architecture you've uh, put into your brain to be able to think through problems. Uh, I'm an unapologetic pluralist, uh, and so I will draw from whatever uh, basket of approaches I think is going to help solve problems. So I tend to focus more on a problem-driven uh, thinker. Uh, it's a nice way, we were actually just having a course on global bioethics. One way to get around a lot of divergent views is to focus on what the problem is and to get clarity on what the problem is. And once you've agreed on what the problem is, then you can start to say, so if you go in and say, hello, I am a card-carrying consequentialist, and whatever you throw at me, I'm going to give you a consequentialist answer to, you're going to have a very interesting, but uh, uh, that would be a career at limited scope. Uh, so you need to have a, a fairly pliable way of thinking about things. The other thing in the end, so I've already sketched out that in the healthcare environment, you're going to have to learn to think like multiple different practitioners. And to say that doctors and nurses and allied health professions, like pharmacists, social workers, think the same way, they don't. And you need to understand how they came to who they were and how they see the problem. So understanding the context of the characters or the actors that you're working with, the variety of theories at your disposal, and also the fact that there's a lot of people who think that you just shouldn't deal with this through a bioethics lens at all. You need law or theology or religious studies or anthropology or sociology or gender studies, cultural studies, decolonization theory, indigenous perspectives, etc., etc. All of these are relevant and all of these you should familiarize yourself. 
So what I'm saying is that you need to have a lot of space in your brain to read and take the time. You guys are in school. This is the greatest time of your life. Read widely. Enjoy it because soon you get into a place where you don't have time to read. And I was, I was thinking as I was walking across campus, and like, oh, this is what the university is about. And you see all the students leaving classes and talking about what their classes, and they're going to go home and do essays and read. And that's what we're doing. And it's just a wonderful time of life. I know it doesn't seem like it, but compared to working life, you've got it. <laughs> so how do you get engaged with ethics? There's lots of ways. There's like the four C's, and you know, I've done lots of this work. So Anna is here, we worked on the revision of the Canadian Medical Association Code of Ethics. And the reason you get dragged into that is you're a person who's got some interest or experience in ethics and you happen to have a medical degree. So that says, okay, you're in, you do that. But lots of professions, and you can think of that as codes for organizations. Uh, there's ethics committees of various stripes. Some of them are organizational, some of them are institutional based. All of them have their works. So the other thing I'll, I'll make a recommendation for is you create your career, and you create your career by volunteering, by giving service. One of the most important things I think that's relevant to building a career is the willingness to serve. That is to go out and offer up your services, often for little or no pay, but that's how you get involved in issues, that's how you build your networks, and then you create the space where people say, you know, that person said something really, and who was that person at that last meeting who made that comment about John Stewart? No, it was really relevant, you know, that was really helpful. But then, then people take notice of you, and then the next thing you know, you're on the committee, and if things really go poorly, you're the chair. Um, commissions, there's all sorts of commissions that are uh, looking for help and work on, on bioethics but also a collaborator. So I also encourage you to engage in scholarship. Start to put down your thoughts and your reasoning and try to publish it. Make it conscious so you serve the community and then you, you, you participate in the scholarly life, the development of the concepts, the ideas, the toolbox of ways that we're thinking about complex ethical issues. Become a voice and become a collaborator. Uh, many of us are involved in research projects that aren't about ethics, that have an ethics dimension, where our skills are actually of value and use. So become involved. Um, and then there's just different ways of applying the principles framework. So uh, I, I have to admit to having a phase of my life where I really liked ethical frameworks and perhaps made a few too many. And then people kept coming back and saying, so Ross, how do you just, like this, this is a really interesting creature when you tease it apart. It's a little bit of this and it's a little bit of that. And it's like, well, haven't you ever heard of a hybrid? You know, aren't I allowed to take a little bit of this? But no, it's not consistent. But frameworks are actually ways of helping people organize their thoughts around problems. So it would be that theme theoretically to sort of some variant of normative theory of limited scope. So you're taking ideas from bioethics to apply to particular problems, and of course you get involved in regulations and laws, and of course there's always research ethics boards that are looking for people who have great skills to become involved with them. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> so what are the challenges? You have to do a tri-council policy. Yes. Has everybody go home tonight and do your tri-council policy tutorial to get your certificate, and then you can serve on an REB. So what do I see as five key challenges going forward? Well, always and ever, and this hasn't changed since I started. It's just that it's just a different uh, technology. So you know, early in my career, it was you know ICUs were becoming uh, generalized. Uh, there's always some form of high technology challenging people's thinking, and there's always a lot of overblown concern about it. So right now, there's a kind of particular mania for artificial intelligence and machine learning and big data, and how this is going to transform life as we know it. Uh, within your life cycle as an adult uh, in this field, you'll probably see five or six technologies come along that are going to completely redefine. I didn't put gene drive, but that's in there. Um, I've talked about interprofessionalism because that's a big issue in institutions, how different professions uh, get along. Uh, as we're moving towards more team-based models of care or approaches uh, for uh, healthcare delivery, uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of tensions because often codes of ethics, scope of practice don't line up. 
and I've already talked to an intra-professionalism, so between. I've mentioned already uh, organizational issues. I find it fascinating uh, when you actually start to look at the mission, vision, values, statements of organizations that are meant to collaborate together, and you see how divergent. You think, well, you know, it's kind of predictable if you look at what their mission and their vision is, that they're not going to get along, and they're going to run into difficulties, but they kind of work on this pretense that everybody's under the same tent. Uh, it doesn't actually work that way. Uh, globalization, global health, environmental issues are back on top. Um, but I think there's some really critical issues within healthcare itself. So we're going to, we're going to, we've got a super agency now. So at least in the Ontario context, once again, and it's not just Ontario, every jurisdiction uh, and every state and every province and every country in the world is working on some very difficult challenges related to aging, uh, complex patients, sustainability of systems tied into that, issues around resource allocation, etc., etc. These are perennial but are being aggravated and need concerted attention. But what I want to come to eventually is what I would call the knowledge to practice gap. So, uh, and I'll save that for a moment. So, technology, I call this slide the link home. This is all the potential data about you. So, you, we're just so, uh, we don't even know ourselves anymore because people know more about us than we know about ourselves. And we probably have multiple different virtual identities uh, that have been reconstituted in databases somewhere. So, this is the vision of big data that people think of. It's, it's got everything, right? Wearables, genomes, exomes, proteomes, your microbiome, we'll be taking school samples. So from the environment, social network, everything. And all of this can be linked together in, in, and give an absolutely perfect predictive model of your future and your health state. And the interesting thing is, nowhere on that slide does the word ethics arise. <laughs> and when you think about all the linkages, all of the issues, all of the concerns, uh, big data, big ethical problems. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, knowledge to uh, practice gap. So in 2014, I was involved uh, quite deeply with the policy and institutional, organizational, governmental response to uh, Ebola. And uh, Max Smith, who was my PhD student at the time, now a, a professor at uh, Western University, he wrote this paper, it's a bit grumpy and dark, I don't want you to go there. You know, Ebola and learning lessons from moral failures, who cares about ethics? Um, and so what we found is like, even before the uh, outbreak was over, there was this profusion of papers about learning lessons from Ebola. And, and it's a wake-up call. And I thought, you know, I'm not that old, and I'm getting older, but it struck me that after SARS, after H5N1, after H1N1, after Zika, there were all these papers about how it was a wake-up call, and there was a, you know, a, a need to learn lessons. And because I've been working on each and every one of these outbreaks, it struck me as conspicuous that all of these lessons that we were learning were virtually the same lessons. And in fact, all of them were ethical lessons. So for example, David Navarro, who was the UN Special Envoy uh, for Ebola, came to Ottawa, had a meeting with the NGO sector. They were trying to keep people bringing resources and money to combat uh, Ebola in West Africa. And he said, you know, we've learned you know, 10 things that we've learned. And nine of them were ethical issues, all of which were known since before SARS. And here's the guy heading up the world, no, not the World Health Organization, which is a subsidiary of the UN. This is the top dog, and he's kind of scratching his head saying, you know, there's these issues. And I said, you know, David, these are all ethical issues. So we don't learn lessons, we don't carry forward. And this exercised me because there's a lot of scholarship on these topics, and I've contributed a lot to this. And we've done a lot of scholarship, but it wasn't getting anywhere. In other words, there's this knowledge to practice gap. And so what I would really challenge you, the future of bioethics, is to get it into the brains of people who need it so they can act upon it. Because the World Health Organization loves I could do another, I could do another series with uh, you know, the 10 WHO guidance documents, ethics guidance documents I've worked on. They all sit on the shelf. So there's a whole guidance document on epidemic response. What are the ethical issues in a global epidemic outbreak? And they also have a big manual on how to control an outbreak. 
right? And it's got checklists. If you want to know how to rat proof a building, it will give you all the details you need. But nothing from that ethics document translates or, or shows up in that technical document. They live in two different worlds. So bridging that world to me is really the critical stance. So we we're at a meeting and I said, we need another guidance document like I need root canal without anesthetic, which was not a popular thing to do. I was argued that rather than spend money on creating a new guidance document that nobody's going to read and act upon, we should be engaging health communicators, uh, somebody that's going to, you know, an infographic or a YouTube video would probably be of more value than another guidance document. And I know that sounds harsh, it wasn't a well-received message. In fact, they disinvited me from the committee for a while. <laughs> they eventually invited me back. But we really need to think about how we translate what we know about what guidance documents have. And we still have that problem with research ethics, right? Everybody reads the document, but they don't internalize it, and they still run into the same mistakes when they're doing research. So that would be my advice to you. Work on that knowledge translation. Find creative ways of using your knowledge of the bioethics field to get it into the hands so that it's useful to people when they're solving problems. It doesn't sit on a shelf somewhere completely unlinked, and then you don't have to write grumpy papers like I do. So there are some people who are thinking about the horizon, and I saw that you had this on your uh, Facebook page. So Nuffield uh, Council. Uh, for bioethics, did a kind of scoping exercise in which they set out what they saw the that's on the horizon. I know it's hard to read from the back, uh, but we can circulate the link to it. It's already up. You know, and they take about human uh, reproduction, shaping human beings, so the whole gene drive stuff, beginning and end of life, health and society, food and farming and the environment, crime and society, research ethics. So there's a whole lot of issues where you can find your own special area of expertise. So the future of bioethics is bright, and there will be more and more issues to deal with. But one way also is to sort of look at uh, what the World Health Organization has identified as the uh, 10 global threats. Uh, this is a document that just came out. So at the top was issues around air pollution and climate change. And you might say, where are the ethical issues there? Scratch the surface a little bit, and they'll start to pop up. Non-communicable diseases have already alluded to the uh, great burden of multimorbidity, aging, appropriate management of people with cognitive decline, uh, what kind of communities we're going to structure. And those are kind of normative responses, fundamentally. Uh, global influenza pandemic hasn't gone away. Fragile and vulnerable situations, refugee health, strife, uh, uh, war, etc. Antimicrobial resistance, which really is, so these all sound very notional, but when you're on the ground, people say, you know, the best way to deal with antimicrobial resistance is we know, oh, well, somebody in this room is a VRE, you know, vancomycin resistant enterococcus carrier. So you can't leave the room until we've swallowed you all. And then when we find you, and then when we find you, we're going to treat you. And they'll think, you know, infection control people think, this is a really good idea. And you might think, well, what about issues about consent and things like that? So really basic stuff comes in, and that's actually happened in one of our hospitals. Ebola and high threat pathogens I've alluded to, uh, weak primary care systems. That actually speaks to all of the arguments about fair allocation of resources, how you set out at a system level to provide the most benefit for the most people. It's kind of consequentialist argument. Vaccine hesitancy, which is a current topic now with the measles outbreak, dengue and HIV. So some things remain the same. Technology is an evolving. It was there when I started. It was there now, and I'm coming to the end of my career. End of life issues. The very first bioethical questions I worked on were do not resuscitate orders, and believe it or not, advanced directives. Early on in the mid in the early 80s, when Peter Singer and Fred Lowy were running the Joint Center for Bioethics, we had an advanced directives working group. Advanced directives are they in advance? And here we are, some 30 odd years later. And the data hasn't changed. There's still the same proportion of people. You know, you talk to people, yeah, I should fill out an advanced director. Do you think your family should know about your end of life versus, yeah, they should? Do they know? Proportions <coughs> haven't changed at all. But we do have assisted dying now, so some things change in, in interesting ways. That whole theory practice gap is or issue is going to come on. Effective ethics education. I think there's really a lot to be said there. Um, this is something I've been involved in with the 
professional colleges because all of the health professions are moving to what's called competency-based education. Some of us have argued fruitlessly that some ethics can be competency-based, like you can checklist somebody taking a consent form, but some resists being written out into competencies because it's a deliberative skill. Uh, it's a cultivation of judgment, etc., etc. So that's a really interesting uh, horizon. And Daniel Callahan, uh, writing on the 50th anniversary of the uh, Hastings Center, which he was a founder on, looking back, he says, when I look back, I'm struck by the persistence of most of the topics the Hastings Center worked on in its early years. End of life care, still a big issue, not resolved. Human subjects research, yep, still there. Uh, genetic developments, think of gene drive, the CRISPR editing uh, things, costs in equitable health care, and reproductive issues. So in some ways, the more things change, the more they stay the same. They evolve and they change, but your future is bright. There's a lot of things for you to do. Again, I implore you to be of service, to mix your labor, to be a scholar, to be a good colleague and a collaborator. So I don't know what you're going to see in your career. I'll be maybe long gone, but I hope to see some of it. And I hope your career doesn't end like this. So uh, this is a man standing at a pharmacy that says, Fear and loathing about the future have shaken me to the very core of my being, and several times a day I'm brought to my knees by soul-crushing despair. What's good for that? <laughs> Bioethics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. That was very insightful, and um, I'm sure a lot of students here will have a lot of things to take away from that presentation, so thank you. Okay, um, so now we're going to move on to the panel discussion. So, um, unfortunately, one of the panelists wasn't able to be here today, so we now have three amazing panelists um, with a lot of insight, as Ross kind of alluded to in the introduction. And um, before beginning the panel presentation, I just want to say, uh, I just want to ask everyone to hold their questions until the end when we have all the panelists and Ross sitting at the front and maybe they can all together and um, jointly talk about the questions that you have. Um, I also want to say that the presentation is being recorded, so when you do, when it does come time to having, uh, to raising your questions, just note that your face will not be shown, but your voice will be heard by the audience online. So that's just something to keep in mind. And also, following the panel discussion, there will be an opportunity for general networking. So if you can't get to your question during the panel discussion, you'll have an opportunity to chat with um, the mentors that are here today afterwards. OK, so let's start with, um, we're going to start with Dave, Dr. Dave Langwa. Dave Langwa is a clinical ethicist and the director of the fellowship program at the Center for Clinical Ethics. Before joining the CCE, Dave earned his PhD in Harvard's University, Harvard University's Department of Philosophy. While studying at Harvard, Dave was a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada doctoral fellow and a graduate research fellow at the Edmund J. Safra uh, Center for Ethics. After completing his doctorate, he was an SSHRC postdoctoral fellow at Queen's University, University Kingston, and then a clinical ethics fellow at the CCE. Dave is interested in a wide range of topics in bioethics, but has special interests concerning substitute decision making, uh, end of life care, and the limits of patient autonomy. So please welcome, please welcome Dave and join me in. Welcome. So, uh, I, and I wasn't sure what to say until I wanted to hear what, what Dr. Upshur was going to say. I was hoping the other people would go before me and then I could hear what they would say. Um, so, uh, my background is in philosophy, um, and unintentionally so. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I'm so happy about in seeing a, a thing like this happen is that I wish that, you know, in the late 90s when I knew I wanted to do ethics but I didn't know exactly what that would mean for me, I wish that there were events like this where I, and maybe they were, and I, was, I actually was a terrible student at the time, so maybe the events existed and I didn't go to them, but uh, I'd rather blame other people, so I wish that somebody had made events like this uh, in the past and I could have gone to them and asked questions because it probably would have saved me time and a lot of heartache um, in, in you know the last 15 years before ultimately getting to where I am now, which I'm, I'm very happy with. Uh, so I want to reflect very briefly on the path that I took, 
uh, but only to then make a, maybe a, a broader point. Uh, I really only have one takeaway because it's what I was able to come up with during during Ross's talk. So, um, when I was young, doing you know uh, the end of high school, early undergrad, I became very motivated for reasons that I uh, that I won't go into to get a career in in ethics and bioethics. And at the time, I didn't know exactly what that might look like. And so I talked to people and I said, where should I go if I want to study ethics? And they said, go to the philosophy department to study ethics. And so then I did that. Uh, and then I did okay enough at it that they just kept saying, well, keep doing that more. Uh, and then I did that more and then I moved to the States and then I spent like 10 years in grad school. Um, and at some point early on in that process, I was like, what am I, what am I doing? Like why? And, and if you if you want something that's not really entertaining, but it's entertaining to me, like I can send you a copy of my dissertation, which is like the most useless thing ever written. Sincerely, it's, it's terrible. Um, but what happened is that I found myself caught up in this stream that I think often can take over for people who, at an early stage, are academically oriented and decide that they want to do ethics or bioethics, and it's to follow the kind of academic path. Uh, as far as that will take them. But for me, as somebody who was originally motivated because I cared about actual things that occur to actual people in the real world, and I wanted to make a difference in other people's lives, ideally, I wound up very unsatisfied by, by what I wound up doing in, in a philosophy department. And so I then had to make this hard transition and swerve, uh, which I have been you know, mildly successful at, and which has been wonderful for me. I got lucky and met some nice people, and I managed to integrate into actual clinical bioethics practice, and now I get to spend a whole bunch of my time uh, and life um, working with patients uh, and, and clinicians and helping them sort out you know, real world problems. And I also get to do, uh, you know, a, participate a fair bit in sort of systems level bioethics as well, and I get to teach people, and, and I love it. And so I thought, in you know, reflecting on, on this weird path that I've taken, I sort of thought, okay, what is the thing that I wish I had learned when I was sort of on your side? Um, and also, I, I want to say, like, for anyone who wants to do the academic, pure academic route, like, I have no objections to that, but what I'm going to say, I hope, applies to you um, as well. I, I think my main takeaway so far, and I'm still relatively early in my career, is the following. So uh, I've come to think of, of bioethics as kind of a spectrum of abstraction. That on the one hand is, is maybe the lowest level of abstraction, uh, which is the kind of bioethics that occurs at the bedside. Um, and, and that's the stuff that I, as a young person, was very you know, motivated to participate in. And you can kind of move from there out further away from the bedside and up to sort of the, the philosophical la la land that I found myself in a few years ago. And there's lots of intervening and intermediary steps along the way. So a little bit further distance from the bedside is the nursing station, and then you have the kind of bioethics that goes on in, in healthcare institutions at the administrative or organizational level. And then you've got lots of neat stuff that happens at, at a systems level uh, and an intra-systems level. Um, that's also where stuff, it's, it's unfortunate that the media uh, contributor wasn't able to come as well. I think a lot of uh, bioethically informed media work occurs at that sort of intermediary stage as well. And then on the other sort of furthest out stretch in, in the other direction is the kind of abstruse moral theorizing that occurs in philosophy departments and lots of bioethics programs and stuff like that. And um, I think the most powerful and legitimate criticisms of bioethics in general is that the stuff that occurs at different nodes somewhere along the spectrum is often very poorly informed about the stuff that occurs elsewhere on the spectrum. And so it's very common to see people who are really engaged at the bedside really not feel the force or see the value in the abstruse moral theorizing that occurs in philosophy departments. And meanwhile, if you spend time talking to folks in philosophy departments, they'll often kind of be like, oh, you know, the bioethics that occurs in hospitals, huh? Like it's fake. It's like a, a pale reflection of real bioethics, which you do uh, in, in your office never talking to anybody. Um, and I, I, I think the, the interesting thing is that they're both right about the quality and importance of what they're doing and wrong about the quality and importance of what their colleagues are doing elsewhere on the spectrum. 
And what I kind of come to feel is that the further you get away from the other side, the less people are inclined to see the importance of what occurs at the other side. So the folks who work sort of in the middle, maybe because they work in law or policy, like they're a bureaucrat, they're sometimes forced into conversation, you know, on one hand with the more theoretical aspects, on the other hand with the more practical and concrete aspects. But if you go really far down to the bedside and people do uh, you know, biophically informed work there, sometimes they don't have a lot of training in moral theory, and vice versa. I've had a lot of really frustrating, frustrating conversations with lovely and brilliant people who do biophically informed theoretical work who've never set foot inside a hospital. Um, and it really does, in both directions, detract from the quality of their work. So, I mean, my big pitch for people who want to get into biophysics is not so much about where I think that they should locate themselves along that spectrum, because we need people working in bioethics everywhere along that spectrum, and I sincerely believe that. But I think you will do yourself a huge service and do a huge service to the community and to the people who you'll interact with if you try to make yourself as well informed as you can about the issues and the work that gets done all along that spectrum. Now, there's obviously only so much that anyone else can do. There's not a way to train yourself. Like, before. you know what some amazing people do, because there are people who are bioethicists and doctors and stuff like that, which is always amazing to me. Um, but, you know, most of us have limited time, and so we can only do a couple of things. It's unrealistic to be like, oh, I'm going to spend 10 years being a bedside nurse, and I'm going to spend 10 years getting, you know, PhD in abstract moral theory, and I'm going to also do a whole bunch of systems level theorizing, and I'm going to not necessarily realistic. But we can, that can still be a sort of aspirational point for us, right? We can, we can try our best to engage with the high quality of work that occurs all along the spectrum. And more importantly, I think, one of the wonderful things about bioethics uh, that occurs these days is how interdisciplinary and collaborative it is, right? Like you can identify the, 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 the the places where you might have weaknesses or not know enough and reach out to and work with other people who have more knowledge along other areas of the spectrum. So one of the things that I love about the team that I work with is that, you know, the director of our center and one of the people who I work most closely with on all our current research projects is Michael Sago, who's trained as a geneticist. And so we complement each other very nicely because, you know, he, his background is in this thing that I could not conceivably know less about. And that's very, very helpful to um, so that's, in a way, my only big pit. How long do I have? Because I have other things I can say. Five, Five minutes. Six minutes. Six minutes, wow. Um, so, uh, and I'm happy to talk more about that piece. So practically, another thing that I can say, and I'm, this is not a pitch, like, it, this is not to suggest that you should, like, tr we run, our group runs a fellowship program. This is not a pitch for our fellowship program. Um, sincerely. But uh, I do think it is worth thinking early about how you want your career to go, and to be very intentional in trying to take the steps that are going to help facilitate you going wherever you want to go. So if that means that you want to have like a tenure track bioethics gig somewhere in the world, you're going to have to work hard to make that happen. If you want to work in clinical bioethics at the front line of being an actual bioethics consultant, I would advocate strongly for figuring out what it is that you'll need to do in order to make yourself a competitive applicant to one of the many high quality fellowship programs that there is in, in, in uh, North America and in the UK. Uh, and I, I think a, a thing that was really hard for me, and I really got lucky, and it was, it was unfair and lucky, was that I managed to do a whole bunch of really useless, unimportant work, and then sort of luck and talk my way into doing a clinical or applied fellowship. But that is not the strategy I would recommend. So if I could go back in time, well actually if I could go back in time, I would do the same thing because it worked out for us. But if, if, I could, if I had to give like a recommendation to somebody else, it would be, be like laying the foundation as early as you can. And I mean volunteering, like getting actively engaged, serving on a hospital's ethics committee early in your career, trying to become a volunteer member on a, on a research ethics board, collaborating in research even before it feels like you're ready to begin collaborating in research. Go to events like this, meet people, and really start collaborating and trying to lay the foundations for your career because the unfortunate thing is right now, if you want to do clinical bioethics, there are very few fellowship spots across 
uh, North America and the UK. I mean, every year, at least in good programs, there's probably you know 10 or 15 spots in, in good biophysics fellowship programs uh, across Canada and the United States. So if you want one of those, you have to start working early to make yourself competitive for them. Um, that's basically all I've got. I mean, I've got other things that I can say, but they would take longer than three minutes. So maybe I'll save them for, for the discussion afterwards. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> Because I can't 
imagine is just me. I think it's, it's the analytical approach that you bring as an ethicist, as um, a lawyer, as a philosopher, as someone who's been thinking about ethics issues. Because what I find important is that you are helping people come up with justifiable reasoning, good reasoning. And sometimes you say, well, okay, if that's the way you want to go, it would look like this. Reasoning, reasoning, conclusion. And they go like, oh, that doesn't sound good at all. I don't want that. Hold on. Let's rethink this one. So then you go, okay, another option would be this kind of one. Oh, that sounds much better. That would pass the newspaper test tomorrow morning if it gets in the newspaper kind of thing. So sometimes you have to be um, flexible. I mean, we each practice differently, and I'm sure Ross and uh, Dave and Diane would disagree with me on certain parts. Um, we each practice differently. We each bring our own strengths to the practice of bioethics. But my my love is to help people with that justified decision making. And uh, I don't like to be, come in there and say this is what you have to do. I'm the ethicist because, of course, you've got clinical, legal, ethical, organizational, and systemic dealing with power imbalances to consider in coming up with the best solution. And ethics doesn't override necessarily all the others. So you're part of that team coming up with what that good solution is. So let's see what else. Um, so in your stages, in the stage you're at now, exploring what you want to do, please come and ask us questions. We won't butt your head off. We'll make the time to talk to you. If we don't have the time to talk to you, we'll find someone else to talk to you, or we'll tell you when we are available. Please don't be shy. This is all part of what we experienced as we were going through. So we're happy to pay it back to you, and you are going to pay it all forward. So please, come and ask us all questions. Everybody at the Joint Center is happy to talk to you and, and give you suggestions on what to do next. So integrating bioethics into my career, as I said, started with research ethics. And that was a pretty narrow, I mean, research ethics is pretty narrow. So when I did the NHSC at the Joint Center, it's like, whoa, there's a whole bunch more here to think about. This is really interesting. Um, so what else were we going to say? Um, anyways, so what you need to do is figure out what your passion is. It could be teaching, could be communication. Um, I've, I've seen people do um, a master's degree in education with their ethics to come out and work with ethics and communication. Really, really important. Um, because, I mean, if you look at all the research ethics consent forms, are they written in PhD language, or are they written in understandable plain English for your grandmother? <laughs> so we don't do a very good job in communicating. So that's really important. Um, anything that you find um, ma makes you passionate would be a great background for ethics. Because it because working in that area first, let's say, um, whether you're a social worker or a dentist lawyer or a physician or a nurse, um, any of those areas, any areas that relate um, to health care, um, provide you a great combination when you want to get into bioethics. So I didn't get into bioethics through a PhD, so I don't get, I don't tend to go a lot deep with my consultations. I tend to be a little bit more higher and broader. Um, but you bring that knowledge and that skill. So, you know, people who have psychology degrees bring tools from their psychology behavioral kind of um, toolkit. Uh, we all bring something different to it. So find your passion, reach out, and you'll get there. I'll stop there. Again, it speaks to the recurring theme of passion um, being the guiding kind of foundation for, for your career in bioethics. Okay, and um, we'll end with Dr. Diane Godkin, who offers, again, another unique perspective into careers in bioethics. 
Dr. Dana Godkin is a senior ethicist at Trillium Health Partners. Her prior education includes a postgraduate clinical ethics fellowship from the University of Toronto, PhD, Master in Nursing, and Master of Nursing degrees um, from the University of Alberta, of Alberta, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Western Ontario. She is currently the president of the Canadian Bioethics Society. She worked as a nurse for several years at University Hospital London, primarily in cardiology and hematology. Following completion of her MN, she worked in a number of roles at the Faculty of Nursing, University of Alberta. Her work as a healthcare ethicist began in 2003 at the Center of Clinical Ethics, a joint venture of Providence Healthcare, St. Joseph's Healthcare, and St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, and she has been working in this capacity at Trillium Health Partners since 2009. Her research interests include the use of qualitative methods to explore end-of-life decision-making and advanced care planning. She has presented and published on a number of ethics-related issues, including a book based on her doctoral research with the title Living Will, Living Well, Reflections on Preparing an Advanced Directive. Diane has also been the recipient of a number of awards. So please join me in welcoming our final speaker, Diane Barr. Thanks very much, Sydney, and, and thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about my story here with you uh, this evening. I'll begin by talking just briefly about what healthcare ethics is, and then using some photographs, I'm, and I'm hoping a little bit of humor, so please feel free to giggle or laugh along the way. Um, I want to portray to you something about what it's like to be a healthcare ethicist, so I'm going to highlight some of the challenges and rewards. I'll talk a little bit about some of the skills and character traits that might be helpful. Uh, if one is to succeed in the, field, in the field. So for any qualitative researchers in the audience, I'm, I'm trying to uh, tell you a little bit about the lived experience of a healthcare ethicist. I'll also say a few words about what healthcare ethics is not. I'll tell you about my background, the path I took to becoming an ethicist, and I'm going to build a little bit on uh, Ross's crystal ball to say what I think some of the opportunities for the future might be for, um, for ethicists. So I won't say too much about the historical roots of healthcare ethics, except to say that it's a relatively new field. It's emerged out of the field of bioethics, another relatively young discipline. Um, its development has been fueled, as Ross mentioned, by things like technologies, uh, a better, uh, more sophisticated and better informed public, an increasing sense of our global connections and impact. In Canada, to the best of our knowledge, the first clinical ethics service uh, was established in the 1980s and it was at uh, St. Joe's Hospital in uh, in the Catholic health system here in Toronto. Uh, in the past few years, clinical ethics has really grown quite exponentially. Um, in the greater Toronto area, pretty much every hospital, every teaching hospital for sure, has an ethicist within their environment, and they're starting to see ethics in other places as well, community organizations, home and community care, etc. So what is the goal of healthcare ethics? It's really about supporting principle-based um, decision-making from the point of care right through to the boardroom. And the kind of ethical issues that arise in healthcare can be anything from the macro organizational ethics issues about you know, how do we spend our budget to the microethics issues at the interface of the patient and the healthcare team. What to do if the patient's refusing medical treatment, if the patient's unable to make decisions for themselves, or if you have a substitute decision maker who doesn't seem to be acting in the best interest of the patient or acting in accordance with their wishes. So how is that goal achieved? It's through a variety of different mechanisms, uh, through consultations around specific cases, through education of staff and students, through involvement and development and review of ethics related policies, through participation in research ethics boards, where the focus is the protection of human subjects, and in conducting ethics research, examining issues of particular interest to the clinical ethicists or the institute and or the institution where they work. So with that general description of the goals and activities, I'll move a little bit more into the experience. So being a healthcare ethicist requires diving right in to the midst of what can sometimes be troubling, tragic, and even frightening situations. So a consult may revolve around a decision about whether or not to remove life-sustaining treatment from a young trauma patient. Those in fright involved in the discussion may be angry, distraught, frightened. Staying in the moment and helping people work through their feelings is a very important aspect of the role. Sometimes we have to get our feet wet. Sometimes it isn't a nice, neat, and tidy answer. And as this diagram also 
it illustrates the work of a healthcare ethicist, I believe, is best accomplished if there's uh, someone else, at least in the background, to accompany you. Someone that you can talk to about those difficult cases, um, who can empathize with your situation and help you work through. So being a healthcare ethicist also requires continuous reflection and self-awareness. It's important to be able to identify one's own biases and develop a strategy for preventing those biases to influence how you approach a particular case. When you go home each night, you need to be able to look yourself in the mirror, feel okay about what's transpired. Even when situations don't necessarily resolve as you had hoped, it's important to be comfortable with the process and confident that there's been a fair and reasonable process undertaken. And if you're not comfortable with that process, then it's the time to look, to, to look around and see what else needs to happen. Maybe there needs to be policy changes, maybe there needs to be practice changes, further education, etc. Sometimes uh, in healthcare ethics, you find yourself in tight places without much wiggle room. Um, on many occasions, we, we get consulted a little bit late in the process when things have kind of spiraled out of, out of control or into a crisis and the parties are firmly uh, rooted in opposing corners. Uh, so we have to really try hard to, try to come together to try to some, find some common ground. Um, you'll often hear us talk about trying to get us involved sooner rather than later to try to prevent some of these uh, tight spots. Healthcare ethics requires nourishment. I'm actually one month Diet Coke free. I have been a complete addict for so long. This, this was my, <laughs> my uh, that was my nourishment for a long time was Diet Coke. Um, so I need to replace the slide with something, something else. Uh, but it's important to continue to read, to dialogue with others, to attend conferences and workshops, and generally just to be engaged in a process of lifelong learning. Um, and my other comment was you just need to cope for the caffeine kick. It helps you get through those uh, long and lengthy review, research ethics board review uh, processes. Something else I learned along the way uh, is that things are never exactly as they might first appear. So this particular slide says, um, honey, please just calm down and let me explain. You've got a Dalmatian dog with a whole litter of Dalmatian kittens. <laughs> um, so often we're consulted about a particular issue that's arisen. When we actually dig a little deeper, peel off some of the layers of the onion, we find out that it really wasn't about X. It's much more about Y. So that's what uh, this slide is talking about. Sometimes health, uh, doing healthcare ethics actually requires sitting quietly, watching, and actually doing very little. Uh, sometimes it's about making space, both metaphorically and physically speaking, for reflection on ethical aspects of a situation. Sometimes that's all that's needed. Uh, every individual is a moral agent capable of engaging in ethical reflection. Staff may just need some time and help and encouragement to do so, and someone to actually affirm that that's okay. It's, it's, it's time well spent. Sometimes our role is to slow the process down. So in a hectic healthcare environment, there's often a, a real drive to move things forward, move them quickly. Uh, but sometimes I think we need to just pause, take a step back, make sure that we're actually going down the, the best path. Sometimes being a healthcare ethicist requires, metaphorically speaking, sleeping with strange bedfellows. Um, the healthcare team wants you on their side. Administration wants you to back up their decisions, patients and families assume that you'll be advocating for them. So sometimes we really are trying to bring all these different perspectives to the table, but not uh, aligning ourselves with any particular um, perspective. It requires excellent communication skills, conflict negotiation skills, and an openness to hearing all of the perspectives. As a healthcare ethicist, we do sometimes find ourselves in awkward and potentially dangerous situations. If we ask a tough question, a difficult question, uh, or complicated situation by identifying factors that may have not been thought about or accounted for, um, sometimes our participation is not always appreciated, and so we occasionally um, might, I think somebody said, I mean, about being asked to leave a committee, I think that was you, Ross. Sometimes we find ourselves in those particular sorts of situations. Sometimes we bring to the surface emotions that might have been suppressed. Um, we need to be ready for that, expect the unexpected develop a bit of a tough skin, and uh, something I think I'm still working on. Um, and we do, from time to time, we'll get, we'll get consults around, you know, come and convince the family that they must do X or, or Y. And so it's really, again, about clarifying the role. It's not about uh, making people listen to us or do what we think is best. 
but rather to ensure that all the avenues have been explored and to facilitate the decision-making process. Now, in case I've painted a picture of healthcare ethics that focuses too much on the challenges and pitfalls, I want to say that on many occasions things go swimmingly. And when it's very clear that our participation is actually guided guided us towards a much better decision or a change in practice or a change in policy. Um, you know, and you know, even when a staff member when you've done an educational session says, you know, I learned something today that's going to change my practice. Those are uh, the kinds of experiences that sustain us and, and drive us to continue. So what you won't find in healthcare ethics, uh, I'll just talk a couple minutes about that. How am I doing for three minutes? There won't be a lot of time for just laying around and soaking up the sun. No two days or two situations are alike. Every situation brings its own unique context and has subtle distinctions. You won't ever be bored. Uh, so those are some of the things that won't happen. So now just a little bit about my story and how I ended up in healthcare ethics for the last 16 years. I track my interest in principles such as fairness uh, back as far as the East Egg hunt that took place when I was three and a half years old. So it's evidence from this photo that uh, even then I recognized that fairness did not always mean that things should necessarily be distributed equally. I was a, a little older and a little bigger and my bowl has more Easter eggs than the other person. I thought that was just, that was justifiable. So, uh, <laughs> So before becoming healthcare ethicist, as was mentioned, I was educated and worked as, as a nurse. Um, and to a large degree, really, it was my experience as a nurse that led me into the field of ethics. Um, as, as Ross mentioned, I, I didn't know what to call the problems that I was facing at the time, but they were ethical issues. And there were three kinds of general experiences in particular that, that uh, moved me in that direction. And they all had, were giving me moral distress, although I didn't know that's what it was, was at the time. The first had to do, to do with the way that end of life was approached, uh, or perhaps more accurately, how it was not approached, how death was not talked about, was not planned for. The second was more of a resource issue, and I can remember many shifts going home at the end of the day and saying, you know, I wasn't satisfied with what I had done as a nurse that day. I had done all the tasks, all the IVs, you know, were started, all the meds were given. Um, but I didn't feel like I'd been a good nurse. I hadn't had time to sit and talk with the patient to find out what was going on with them to, to really understand what impact their illness uh, was having on them. And the third was concerns about informed consent and whether patients or their substitute decision makers were really understanding what we were um, offering to them. Um, and I don't think we were doing a good job of explaining the risks and benefits. I think we just kind of, we had something to offer, we put it on the table and, and we gave it. And I remember one of the, Greatest lessons I learned was from a patient. He was a young patient, about the same age as I was at the time, mid twenties, twenties, late twenties, uh, with a, with cancer, and he'd gone through three or four rounds of chemotherapy, and each each um, uh, remission was getting shorter and shorter. And he said to the physician who proposed another round of chemo, and he, he relapsed. He said, "No, thank you. I'm, I'm going home. I'm going to spend whatever time I have left with my family." That was the first time I'd ever heard a patient say no to something that was was offered and it was a, a profound moment um, for me in terms of learning. Um, so anyway, yeah, lots of, so that's why I really ended up in ethics. I thought I just needed more, I had so many questions, I just thought I needed to go back to school. So I went back to do my master's degree in nursing and it was there that I was introduced to ethics. So I took an ethics course at the gradual level and then I started to understand what, where my questions came from. Um, so during both my master's and then later my PhD, I took a combination of ethics and nursing courses, and then I was accepted to the uh, postgraduate clinical ethics fellowship here at the U of T. And I was fortunate when I finished the fellowship to be hired as a full-time clinical ethicist for the Center for Clinical Ethics. And um, there were three different organizations involved, and they provided a whole range of, of services from long-term care through to uh, you know quaternary care. And it, although getting to know the organizational cultures and the people, three different organizations was a challenge. Uh, it was a, an incredible learning opportunity. It was also an incredibly rich opportunity because I was working with other ethicists, so I, I, we, were, we could work together and, and, and bounce ideas off each other and talk about questions and concerns that we had. 
For the last 10 years, I've been leading um, the regional ethics program at Trillium Health Partners. Um, I'm part of the leadership team there, and I've ex been exposed and involved in many organizational initiatives and challenges. We went through a merger. Um, we're now de dealing with over capacity every day. It's 110, 115% over capacity, so we're constantly trying to figure out which patients we can provide, which surgeries we need to cancel. There are ethical uh, challenges uh, just every coming out of every corner. We're also in the process of master planning for a whole additional uh, 600 beds to be added to our organization. So there's all of those pieces. And we're finally, after five years of being merged, getting a merged medical record. So that's uh, a process that's just uh, happening over the next 18 months. I'm still learning every day. I'm constantly reminded of the fragility of our human condition. And certainly my experiences as a healthcare ethicist help me to appreciate uh, each and every day. So what are the possibilities for the future? Um, my sense is that healthcare ethics is quite embedded into uh, organizations, at least in our, our part of the world. Uh, one of the driving forces has been accreditation, but I think it's, it's more than that. Um, I think that we'll see it moving into a lot more non-traditional uh, clinical environments in the future, places like the pharmaceutical and biotech industry how we will manage the you know, inherent conflicts that might arise of being situated in those kinds of organizations I think remains to be seen, but I think there's opportunities there. I also think there's more opportunities within government portfolios in terms of policy development and uh, that area. So for individuals who wish to pursue a career in health ethics, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think there will be opportunities. The work is important. The work is challenging. Uh, new ethical issues are always emerging uh, because of the nature of health care. Like new technologies, more complex and sicker patients, an aging population. I think I, I'm just saying exactly all the things that we started off with at the beginning in terms of what some of the challenges that going forward are. Um, that's all I'll say. I just have a perfectly long time. Yeah. Um, I'll just put a plug in it. We talked about the volunteerism piece. Uh, as the Canadian Bioethics Society, there's always opportunities for volunteers in many different ways with the organization. So, Put that forward, and we've got some folks who are already volunteering in that capacity here in the room, too. So, look forward to your questions, and uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. It was very, very helpful. Um, I just wanted to make sure we fully appreciate the caliber of expertise we have here on our panel. Um, four very distinguished individuals that we have a lot to learn from. So can we just have another round of applause? For them? <laughs> Before we start the question and answer period, I just wanted to introduce myself as well. Um, my name is Nipa. Um, I am the proud vice president of the U of T Bioethics Society. Um, I also just wanted to mention with that shameless plug, I'm also a graduate student at large for the Canadian Bioethics Society. So I'm very, very happy to connect you um, with new opportunities, new volunteer opportunities, mentorship opportunities, and, um, and if you just want to talk about bioethics, I'm always happy to do that. I'm also the president and founder of our sister club, Cafe Bioethics, which is a very informal, monthly live forum, um, it's about a year running now, where um, anybody and everybody is welcome to come and talk about bioethics. And it's very, very informal, approachable, um, and uh, it's just a matter of public engagement to try and put bioethics on the map, which is very important stuff. Um, so yeah, so let's get started with some questions. I'd love to hear some from you guys. If there are any online as well, I'd love to take those. Yeah, question over here. Yeah. Uh, so I teach uh, bioethics here at St. George, and so the questions I'm always getting from students are just how people are interested in bioethics but don't really know how to pursue a career in this. So, I mean, I know like one thing that came out from uh, all of your talks is like there's lots of different pathways to go. Some of them are easier. I mean, so certainly someone who's going into medicine, I mean, going to medical school or nursing might find That's themselves. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they might find themselves into uh, ethics. Most of the people who are going to do that, though, I think already know they want to go into go to medical school or go to nursing. They probably like the people who are asking me, "I'm interested in bioethics. What should I do?" Probably those aren't the people who are 
you know, headed in that direction. Another possibility is philosophy. That's what I do, and so that's what's easiest for me to understand. Um, but so I, I'm curious about other academic pathways towards a career in bioethics. And I guess there's like law and public health. Are there, are there other things that I should be advising people to think about as far as graduate training? Um, yeah, policy. Uh -huh. So there's schools of policy which, and health policy. Uh, there's a real need for people with bioethics training in policy because they, it tends to get eclipsed. So I think there's real uh, room there. Uh, on, on the academic side, so it's bringing people in that direction. But there's other less obvious ways, but you know, you think things like health geography or environmental studies, uh, there's often quite a lot of uh, ethical issues that don't get addressed. Um, so those are on the more academic side. Organizations need help as well. So there's NGOs. Uh, so we've done a lot of work with NGOs that have ethics needs, uh, Doctors Without Borders being a conspicuous one. Um, but I think it's, you know, the virtue of these uh, uh, events other the networks, and then we can go out in our networks once we know people are where their interests are and try to broker connections. Um, so I think there's a lot more than uh, just, in, and the volunteering side, that we, I think every one of us has said is really critical. Because somebody takes you under the wing and the next thing you know you've got opportunities. Um, so it's a good thing to think of us. Social work. Pharmacy, dentistry, dental offices, all that health profession. Journalism. is big these days. Communications. Theology, religious studies. Yeah. There's a really interesting interface between pastoral care and bioethics that is often not uh, explored as deeply. Um, I think it's all about getting the passion um, and finding ex experiences where you live life, right? Because I think it's all about the messy stuff, and you know, young students say, oh, well, let's make a policy, and you're like, ah, it's not that simple, we'll read it. So you need to get out there and experience working with the different populations and um, in different situations where things are messy. And, and even, even if you're not contributing in an ethics kind of way, just experiencing some of these problem-solving situations, conflict resolution situations, um, so that you're, you're, you're developing stories, so that when you're thinking about ethics, you, you've got stories to apply those principles or theories to. As I mentioned when I was uh, speaking, uh, I mean, I think there will, all, will be healthcare ethics jobs inside uh, large hospitals and those sorts of things. I think it's fairly, uh, uh, there's a number of us getting older that will retire in the not too far future, so there will be some turnover. Um, yeah, that's one area. Uh, I mean, there's definitely there are community organizations that are hiring uh, ethicists. I just actually had a call today around uh, from a, a a, a regional uh, community agency that's looking for ethics support. There's lots of folks out there that are wanting the ethics support. It's just trying to uh, find the money and the dollars to actually support it because I do get an awful lot of calls from places saying, well, can you come and just do this for free? And as much as volunteering is, yeah, is the money, um, there are, you know, there's a various problem there in terms of um, you know, my hospital has to pay, why? why expect to pay your lawyers and your accountants and your all of well, these other folks that are working for your organization. So uh, it's again about making sure that we're valued in terms of uh, yeah. that role. Another growth industry is probably the biotech industry uh, because they're facing uh, pushback and uh, it's, it's a group of India and IT as well. So these are really 
entrepreneurial, adventurous people. Uh, they're kind of unconstrained by thinking about some fairly obvious things they probably should have sorted out before they found themselves in trouble. Uh, so that's a very growing horizon for application. So many of the large pharmaceutical companies, uh, it's a program out of NYU, and NYU has fellows, it's a guy named Art Kaplan, who I know is a fairly entrepreneurial guy, but they're working on these, and I think we sent it around through the list, sir, on these embedded fellowships uh, to work with pharmaceutical companies. Now, you might say, I'm not going to do that. But they do have interesting ethical issues, uh, and they take them seriously. You always have to remember who you're working with, but you're an embedded fellow, so you have academic protection. So there's lots of opportunities. Uh, I think we do need to be a little bit more creative uh, in thinking about what sorts of opportunities can be created in brokering those partnerships. Because people often don't know they have the need because they're stuck in problems that they can't work their way out of. One, one other small point on that is I also think it depends on whether or not, like, or, or how important it is to you that the word ethicist appears in your job title. Yeah. So, I mean, if it's very important to you, then, I mean, where the job titles say ethicist, and there probably will be a lot of those in, in healthcare. Um, but to get to the policy point that you made a few minutes ago, I mean, by, by my lights, I mean, the, the systems level decision making that's going on right now, like in terms of where the actual need is, and a lot of the disconnect between the ideal and practice, it's, it depends or success really hinges on stuff that's carried out at the policy level. Uh, and I've often been struck in some cases by the like brilliance uh, of the people who work in the bureaucracy and some of the incredible things that they actually do to solve problems and uh, you know how the bioethics education of some of the people who I've worked with there as well. And then on the other hand, I've sometimes been tremendously disappointed by the people that I've interacted with who have those jobs. Uh, none of those people that I've interacted with have bioethicists in, in their job title, but they're doing incredibly important bioethically informed work that I would call bioethics, but, but it, 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 they might they might not see it that way, and then neither might be, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, so, going on one of Ross's, well, actually, both of your comments about so when you do a job search, bioethicists might not pop up for those AI companies or tech companies or uh, pharmaceutical organizations. And I just wonder, they might have that need for a bioethicist, but not actually have that uh, job posting. How would you recommend approaching those organizations just as a, hey, I'm this person, you need me, so, but you might not know yet. So you wrote that last slide about fear and despair. <laughs> are there things that are keeping you awake at night in your organization? that you have some inchoate sense of it's a problem, but you don't know how to label it. And then, ah, it's an ethical issue. Uh, just go and knock on doors. I mean, you know, as much as I agree with the, you know, set your direction for your career, um, that's advice I, I never took. I just kind of created spaces to work in. Um, and so you kind of make your opportunity to do the things that you want to do. So be fearless, knock on the door and say, I see you're doing this, uh, have you thought about these things? And you never know what's the worst that's going to happen. They might laugh and say, thanks, but no thanks. But they might say, hey, that's not a bad idea. Especially, I mean, I've learned a lot of, uh, with younger folks in the kind of innovation entrepreneurial space. They like to make things happen that haven't happened before. So if you can sell, you know, persuade them that having an ethics person would be really cool and nobody else is doing it and it's really cutting edge innovation, you never know what's going to come your way, right? I actually had a question, um, which, which is a good, um, it really relates to what you just said, Dr. Rapture. I think a lot of students have uh, come to me, at least undergraduate students have come to me as a master's student, um, asking if what's a concrete way of actually framing their CV or their letter of intent so that at least professors or clinical ethicists 
houses in the area, when they receive this CV or their letter of intent in their email inbox, what's something that should really stand out? What's something that should really catch your eye? So, you know, I've probably written um, a thousand letters of reference. And when I write them for people from philosophy or the humanities, I always stress uh, analytic skills, critical thinking ability, uh, you know, the kind of, th you're not rote learners, right? You know how to actually struggle with problems. You've got a toolkit of analytic skills that you've been taught and trained. You can write clearly, you can think clearly, you know the difference between a premise and a conclusion. Uh, you know how not to know what a fallacy is, all of these sort of things. Um, I don't go into that much detail because the play is over, but emphasizing that kind of creative and analytic and critical skills, because that's what employers actually want people. They, yes, some people want yes men, but they really do value people who can think for themselves and solve problems for themselves. And so those are the sort of things that I would emphasize in letters of reference, and I would suggest that in your CV you show how your education has given you a set of analytic skills and critical skills that allow you to be an independent one, focus your capacity to function independently, because I can tell you most managers love people that they don't have to babysit through every step of the way, so that you know how to think, uh, you're confident, and you know how to think for yourself. Uh, and those would be the sort of things that I would pitch. And that would be refreshing compared to, like, I know how to do an Excel spreadsheet and uh, <laughs> master in Microsoft or, you know. Uh, just to, to add on to that, I think one of the most important things to accompany your CV is that letter of intent. And I'm seeing a, a theme lately when we get applications, there, all that's being submitted is a resume. And there's no, yeah. I have no context. I have no, you need to tell me your story, why, why do you want this job, etc.? So another thing you can do, because you know how to do this, is you're going to be applying to organizations. They usually have statements of purpose and mission and values. You know, I've got mine on a card here in case I forget. You know, so when you're, when you're applying, tie your interests and show how you're going to be mission critical. And almost all of those value statements are ethical statements. And most people have no idea how to reason or think or work with them. So that's a real selling point. Yeah, um, so Jenny asks, is there an emerging field in bioethics and environmental change, specifically the climate change crisis happening now? Should one try to pursue this pathway if they're interested in combining these two areas? Yes, public health. So we've got a course, so I teach a course with Sully Gunter on planetary health ethics, or everyone calls kind of an outgrowth of there's a large it's a belated, so as I said, I started my initial work, actually the first academic presentation I made was at the Canadian Philosophical Association meeting in environmental ethics. So it goes way back in the eighties. There's a lot of interesting work that's been done in environmental ethics does not translate it into the health field at all. And they're kind of discovering it like it's what we pay people actually thought about this. So most of that isn't going to be in schools of medicine. Uh, most of that's going to take place in schools of public health. So there's a real interest there. Respect, and I can, I can usually find out to get a bit of respect by 
saying you're scared. No, I'm not scared. But um, so think about how you would have influence from the bedside all the way up to the boardroom with a bachelor degree. I'm going to say that differently. But. No, healthcare is unfortunately risibly credentials driven. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't apply bioethics in other places, but if you want to work in healthcare institutions, like I don't understand how many years they want us to train now. So I spent 15 years in post-secondary education, and now I feel underqualified. Right? Um, so it's it's yeah, you gotta like school a little bit. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, but fortunately, it's fun being in school. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I have heard from other uh, bioethicists that with the ever-changing uh, healthcare system and the lack of funding that can occur in some places, uh, that bioethicists are most vulnerable only because there is uh, a lack of like an official accreditation. Uh, do you have any comments on that? You know to that those thoughts. Okay. So um, I think absolutely that there is some, um, yeah. Unless you're Diane, who's you know conducting or has a whole team with her, um, I think there is some susceptibility to to changes in funding. So what I've noticed and I thought was brilliant was that there are some emphasis that have dual roles. So they are, you know, Randy Sloan and Charlotte Sickis is part researcher, part ethicist. Sally Bean at the Sunny Book is part policy advisor, part ethicist. She's a law background as well, right? So that helps her there. When I was a law interview, I was part privacy officer, part ethicist. That was interesting. But, um, you know, I think, you know, finding ways to have two things to offer to a hospital might make it a little bit easier to create that job security. What do you guys think? I think the other thing we have to show the organization the value. So sometimes you have to speak their language. So one of the projects we really just recently did in our organization was looking at the, the impact of having an ethicist in our critical care environment. And we actually showed that length of stay decreased and some other things. So, so those are the kinds of things that, unfortunately, that's not necessarily, and it only decreased for those patients who didn't survive. So it's not like we were trying to just move everybody through the system. It was trying to ensure that those individuals who didn't belong in the house uh, weren't going to be helped by uh, intensive care, like the intensive care uh, uh, stays. So I think it's about trying to find what you know, what's a value to your organization and, and being able to show what that value is. I think I am fortunate. I think my, the organization I work with does um, uh, recognize the value in having ethics at, at multiple tables where we sit at every level of the organization. So I, I certainly I think some uh, some organizations that bioethicists or healthcare ethicist positions are more vulnerable, but uh, things like Healthcare Accreditation Canada, fortunately, and it sort of helps us. If you, Accreditation Canada requires that there to be a strong ethics framework. That doesn't necessarily say you have to have an ethicist, but that can be one sort of means uh, down that path. So uh, I think we're here for a while, but I, I don't know if I have to so, The other thing thing to recognize is despite the fact that Ontario spends $60 billion a year on healthcare, Increasingly, everybody feels precariously employed. So if you look at nursing, allied health, so physicians aren't employed by hospitals, but people who work in hospitals and healthcare institutions are finding full-time jobs with where they're going to get a 10 and a 15 year pen are increasingly vanishing. So what you find is that they're working in two or three different uh, uh, organizations to get hours to put it together. And this became apparent during the SARS outbreak because that's when it was realized that, for example, the nursing labor force was completely fractured. There were fewer and fewer people that were at full-time, 40-hour jobs, and they were going back and forth between institutions, and they were prevented from doing that. 
uh, during SARS, and that meant staffing uh, ratios couldn't be kept up. So it's really important to think not about there being, and I know this isn't going to sound very uh, student friendly, but the idea that there are these lifelong career paths out there, and we've got people here with from academia, there's increasingly few tenure screen positions available. So even in higher education, people who are pursuing academic careers often don't find secure academic, you know, uh, employment pathways. Your best asset is going to be your ability to adapt, uh, to take your training, to learn that, you know, I think the question was, do you need just a bachelor's? You're going to be committed to lifelong learning. You're going to be skilling and reskilling and changing direction several times in your career. That's just the way it is these days. You've got to be very nimble and flexible. Um, and there's no guarantees. I mean, uh, I think bioethics will be in, but uh, almost everybody in healthcare, and particularly in sort of your, you can almost feel the palpable unease over the last few weeks before the announcement of what's going to happen, and people are still feeling like the sort of down that pleases over their head, and their service will be cut. And so, yeah, it's just the way, it's been that way for some time. So despite the fact that there's abundant money, $60 billion is a large sum of money, the budget for the World Health Organization is only $5 billion a year, and we spend $60 billion in Ontario. Uh, despite that abundance of resource, uh, most people who are working in the field are feeling a little bit insecure to concur. And, and I, I think along the same lines, I don't know if this is helpful or not, I mean, my, my impression in, in both Canada and America is that the, the number of people who are going to be hired in five positions continues to go up. Like, there are more and more jobs in the field. That being said, at the same time, many particular individuals who are employed feel super vulnerable. Uh, because their jobs don't feel secure. And I think that's partly for the reasons that you were saying, and I think it's also partly due to the nature of the field, and that like, there are no, like we all just have the job because we convince somebody to hire us. But there's no like set qualifications or skills. I mean, the HR system for a particular institution might say we want you to have these standards, but we don't have a college. Uh, there's really no standards around professionalization. We have only a very loose set of core competencies that's been agreed on by a small number of people who actually work in the, in the disciplines. And we uh, have no code of conduct. That's right, that's right. Yeah, the American Society of Biosciences and Humanities does have a code of ethics that's like six pages and says be ethical. So there's, there's almost nothing uh, uh, that clearly delineates the boundaries or content of bioethics. And I think one thing that creates for some people is they wind up in an institution and how they do their work may or may not be a fit for what the institution actually wants. And that's a hard conversation to have. And so people move around a lot in the job. You see, if you look at people's resumes, I'm not just talking about here in Toronto, but internationally, people bounce around a ton, and it's often because they have a hard time finding an institutional culture that works for them. So there are places that just churn through bioethicists, uh, you know, over a period of a decade or so. That's uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and um, I think it's it's hard because because people who are coming in from all these different streams, and it's really interesting. I mean, if you looked at the, the way the three of us do our jobs, I'm sure there are certain areas of overlap. I'm also confident there would be tremendous differences, and certainly between what, what you're doing as a, as, a, as, a, as a physician, what we're doing, in, in, like, there's just so much diversity, uh, and so some people succeed in environments that other people would fail in and vice versa. But, uh, I think that as an, act, as an overall field, lots of jobs, and it seems like there's more jobs, but I do talk to lots of colleagues who feel exceptionally vulnerable.
not to take on that role. There are other bioethicists that may feel more, more confident and strongly on that. Um, a lot has to do with um, how you see your role. As I talked about CLEOS, clinical ethical organization and systemic issues are all part of that group. Um, and I can't, as a, as a lawyer, I can't, unlike Anne, for instance, or Ross, I can't understand all of the medical complexities, and I don't, I don't spend a lot of time, frankly, reading the journal. Because I'm not going to get it. I'm much more interested in figuring out what the perception is of the people around the table that are co coming to me to understand, and then trying to figure out if we figure out what the perception or the wishes of the patients and the families are. And trying to figure out what we don't know and what we can fill in and how that changes. And, you know, looking at some of the the goals that we have and some of the values that we have and some of the principles that we have. But um, yeah, it. Uh, I I personally don't. Anybody want to challenge? I won't challenge you on that because I practice that way as well. Um, the decisions have to lie with who has the accountability. So if it's a medical decision, it's a medical decision. We can be there to support, we can help, uh, we can strongly uh, recommend sometimes, or uh, sometimes it defaults to the legal. Like if I see somebody going down a path where, you know, they like want to take the person to surgery without getting consent, I'm like, uh, no, we really need to. Uh, we need to get concerned. Yes, I urge you to reconsider or consider some of the problems that might, might arise. But it, it is the way I practice is much more of a facilitative role um, and, and making sure that voices that don't necessarily get heard do get heard. Um, and yeah, the, the ultimate decisions tend to lie with, uh, with whoever has the accountability for the outcome, uh, so to speak. So there is uh, one tradition out of the University of Chicago, Mark Ziegler shop, where the idea of an ethics consultation was just like a consultation on a patient, right? So if you have a problem about the heart, you get the cardiologist in, and the cardiologist comes in, does the diagnosis, and makes recommendations on what to do. So many people, many physicians trained in that model, and they come in and think that, yeah, we'll tell you what to do. <laughs> but I think there's certain hazards in, in, in that. Um, even within the tradition of medical consultation, some consultants will recommend to the consulting physician what you should do, and some will actually do it. Um, and uh, in bioethics, you get some people who are fairly directed that come out of that tradition, but they don't actually go ahead and do what they recommend, uh, which they sometimes do in medical consultations. We often get asked, we will often just tell us what to do. Yeah, just don't we do get asked, but we try to help, help them all of us come together and sort of a shared decision making kind of a model. Yeah. Really. And that's where, you know, the law is often the minimal ethic. Just tell me what the law says, tell me what the law says. Hold on. Let's raise that a little bit. <laughs> let's just think about the law. And let's talk about it. So, oh. um, so I think, I mean, uh, Again, I don't know if this is helpful. I mean, over, especially over the last 10 years, and the discussion is still going on, um, there's all this hand-wringing in clinical bioethics literature about whether a clinical ethicist could possess ethical expertise, because that's what you would need, this is what people in the literature say, in order to be able to substantively weigh in on the decision-making and actually give an opinion about what ought to be done, if you would need moral expertise. And it's very odd that th that literature is completely detached from and apparently um, like unaware of all of the work that's been done in moral epistemology, in like philosophical circles, like how one acquires moral knowledge, what moral knowledge is. This is one of those cases that sort of bugs me where there's there's a real life problem that people are trying to solve about like what it is that we should be doing when we go into a consult. And there's people who are thinking about it at different levels and they're, they're not talking to each other. I would say by and large, um, I agree, like I use a facilitative type approach. I don't go in and like make moral recommendations normally. Although my, my personal view is that that facilitative approach, like the reason that I take that approach, is for substantive moral, uh, on the basis of sub, sub, substantive moral beliefs that I have about my role in decision making. So there's some moral substance there, even in agreeing to you know, uh, you know, abide by the facilitative model. And I will also say there are not a, a non-zero number of cases. In, in which we, I have been called in, there's two horns of a dilemma. You could spend as much time as you'd like walking people through the pros and cons of both sides, but what the clinicians would feel most helped by at the end of the day 
is somebody who's able to wade through this with them and from the standpoint of the moral expert, give an opinion on which part of the dilemma seems, uh, seems better or seems to be the, the permissible one, if not, if not both of them are permissible. And I, I can't say whether or not it's, it's the job of the ethicist to do that. I will say sometimes that is, I think, an understandable um, expectation of the clinicians who call us in. And I've also heard along the same lines complaints from clinicians about the uselessness of bioethics that is purely facilitative. So there are times where a clinician is saying, look, if we have a moral expert in the institution, the thing I want to be able to do is call somebody and get an opinion. If I can't even do that, what are you for? Like, just a nice person to talk to? Now, I, I, that's kind of a caricature of a view that some people have, but that view is, is out there, and I think this is sort of an unsettled question in the field still. I, the other question I get asked by uh, undergraduates is uh, something uh, that some of you brought up about volunteer possibilities for people who are either undergraduates or who have just finished their degree um, and are thinking about you know, pursuing this kind of possibility. So I always get asked the question and I just don't really know what the answers are. <laughs> like what, what kinds of volunteer opportunities should they be looking for? Where should they be looking for? Okay, so I'm on a long-term care uh, facility board. Always happy for people who can who can participate. We, we talk about clinical issues, we talk about quality improvement issues, we talk about uh, governance issues, we talk about um, fundraising issues, and we need help on all of those. And I think these kinds of experiences help broaden your perspective on health systems. So look for opportunities where even if it's not specifically just ethics, something that helps connect how everything is working. Um, our research ethics boards are always looking for help. I mean, if you have a legal background, then we need your help. As in, we often have trouble getting legal uh, people on there. Community representatives on research ethics boards are also very important. You can play, play a role there. Um, 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 different organizations, um, professional and um, um, organizations are always looking for help. There's always room for, for people to help. They're all unpaid, just you know, but you're getting a lot out of it if you're, if you're getting into it intensively, right? Uh, I mean, I want to I, it, I think it depends on somebody's career trajectory, also where it's helpful to volunteer. I mean, if somebody, again, I can only speak from the perspective that I have also when I teach philosophy, so if somebody's CV is like philosophy undergraduate degree, philosophy master's degree, philosophy PhD, dissertation on the walls about distributive justice, and they're like, now I want to be a frontline bioethicist. That's a hard sell. Like, wh why? Uh, it just looks weird on paper. Whereas if somebody along the, the way has been doing, like, almost this will sound a little odd, but almost any kind of volunteering in healthcare, the, the perspective on that application is totally different. I mean, if somebody's just been volunteering as a frontline volunteer in a hospital for the last seven years while, the, the, while they've been doing their work on roles, that to me, as somebody who's looking at that application, looks completely different. So there's the obvious things like be on a research ethics board, be on a committee, get uh, on the board of an NGO that does bioethically relevant work. But I think even more basic stuff, like actually just going and helping out at, at local healthcare organizations, is huge. Yeah, get your hands dirty. Uh, so while I was an undergraduate philosophy student, I worked in a hospital as an orderly. I worked up more vomit and blood and stuff then you did that as a physician as well, right? So you don't, you, you can't engage, this is going to sound uh, perhaps radical, you need to engage concretely and understand healthcare institutions and see suffering people, right? It's not an abstract phenomenon. Uh, there are abstract issues that come out of it, but if you really want to understand and engage, I couldn't agree with you more. Most hospitals have volunteer services. There's a lot of work to be done. Most uh, community organizations, where if you want to see where the real coal face of ethical challenges in healthcare are, uh, start working with some of the community-based organizations that are delivering services to, you know, seniors. Just seniors. They need a lot of help. They learn a lot from them. Marginalized populations. Yeah. 
So if you've actually shown you've had your, you put your commitment and done some stuff, uh, so I think you're right, the, you know, I did all these courses and this and that, but I've actually never smelt feces or uh, touched urine or seen blood. I mean, I'm being really concrete, but that's what healthcare is about. Or talked to a stubborn senior. Or somebody who's, you know, like really psychotic. Um, well, on that note, I just want to thank you guys again. I do have a few tokens of appreciation for the four of you, but before um, we get to that, I just want to thank Sydney Campbell, who is the president of U of T Biophysics Society. Very, very humble, so she didn't even introduce herself, but I just wanted to make sure um, there's appreciation for Sydney. So if we could just have a round of applause. Thank you.